In Romans chapter 8, and at verses 1 to 3, uh, we read these verses. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in, in sinful man. <clears throat> I want to repeat those verses now, but only from the, the New Living Translation. It's amazing how most of us were brought up on the authorised version, and then we transferred some to the, the NIV and the New Living Translation, and some even to the Message. And where we've just spent hours with the authorised version, seeking to um, draw from it understanding and, uh, and, and a preaching message. Now we come to verses in the, the New Living Testament and, and the message, and in a sense, it's, it's all there for us. But nevertheless, the Holy Spirit can apply, can apply whatever version of the Bible uh, we, we read and meditate upon. He can apply these uh, thoughts and words to our hearts. But I do like uh, a, a lot of what the New Living Translation has. So we read again Romans 8, verses 1 to 3 in the New Living Translation. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus Christ. For the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you through Jesus Christ from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses could not save us because of our sinful nature. But God put into effect a different plan to save us. He sent his own Son in a human body like ours except that ours are sinful, God destroyed sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Amazing grace. John MacArthur writes, the Bible reveals that since the fall, which is Adam and Eve's disobedience in the Garden of Eden against God's command not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat it, you will surely die. Since then, every human being, every human being born into this world uh, is born with a, a sin nature. Born with a sin nature. And so what David said of himself can be said of, of everyone. Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And Thomas Barston wrote, sin has turned paradise into a thicket. There is no getting through without being scratched. And C.H. Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, sin is a thief. It will rob your soul of its life. It will rob God of his glory. Sin is a murderer. It stabbed our father Adam. It slew our purity. Sin is a traitor. It rebels against the kingdom of heaven. Earlier in his epistle in Romans, uh, Paul declared in Romans 3 and verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because of that universal and in it sinfulness, all believers, all unbelievers, sorry, all unbelievers are under God's condemnation. By nature, they are the children of wrath unbelievers under God's condemnation and before you and I came to faith in Christ we were all like that we were following the passions and the desires of our own civil nature that we were born with and therefore we too at a time were under God's anger just like everyone else someone has said man is not simply influenced by sin but is completely overpowered by it and no one can escape that power by his or her own efforts and so we know and we're told often enough and we can we can read the scriptures that sin is a defiling disease that corrupts every person it degrades every individual it disquiets every soul it steals peace and joy from every heart and replaces them with with trouble and pain 
sin is implanted in every life, in every human life, <clears throat> and its deadly force brings a natural and universal depravity that no one and no man can cure. And so of, as descendants of Adam, we share, <clears throat> we share in the guilt of his sin and disobedience. Thus we are guilty, judged, sentenced, and condemned to eternal separation from the Father. But God, for God had a plan. He sent Jesus to, to intervene, the second Adam. He sent Jesus to intervene and to redeem all those who would, who would trust in him, rescuing us from that serious threat of uh, eternal death and uh, through the gift of faith, giving us, giving us eternal life in himself. You see, the gospel is a two-edged sword. There is bad news and there is good news. The bad news is found in John 3 and verse 18. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. That's the bad news. But the good news, in verse 17, John 3 and 17, for God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Now, why should anyone want to hear the good news unless they first heard the bad news? You know, it's only when a, a building is on fire that men and women will seek a, a way of escape. And it's only when men and women know that they're destined to a lost eternity, they're destined for hell and the lake of fire. It's only then that men and women will want to seek a way of escape. To believe in heaven, to believe in heaven and not in hell, is to declare that there were times when Jesus was telling the truth and times when he was lying. You see, to appreciate justly the gospel of eternal salvation, we must believe in the doctrine of eternal salvation damnation. Let me say that again. To appreciate justly the gospel of eternal salvation, we must believe the doctrine of eternal damnation. You see, when you and I speak about our salvation and we're saved, remember what we've been saved from. It's only the good news of the gospel then that connects you and I to heaven. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's the most familiar and most comprehensive yet most simple text in all of the Bible concerning the way of salvation. God's love, God's love for you and I was demonstrated, was shown in Christ. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And so when you and I consider Jesus, when we look at Jesus, we see two things about the love of God. First of all, it's a love that holds nothing back. God was prepared to give his only son, his only beloved son, as a sacrifice beyond which no other sacrifice could compare with, could possibly go in his search and his love for men. Secondly, it's a totally undeserved love. I suppose it's not, not hard to understand why, why you and I love God, why we love God, when we remember all, all the gifts that he has given to us. But the one that is, that he loves poor and disobedient creatures like you and I, and that by faith you and I will spend eternity together with Jesus Christ. It's just beyond, it's just beyond, and I couldn't think of a word to put there. It's just beyond. The true measure of God's love is that he loves without measure. For God was love long before he has made any, any creatures to be the objects of his love, even from all eternity. He was always, he was always there, he was always love, and he always will be love. God loved us when there was nothing good to be seen in us and nothing good to be said about us. But more than that, 
God loves each one of us, each one of his people, as if there was only one to love. God loves each one of us tonight as though there were only one of us to love. And now because of faith, because of faith in Christ, there's nothing you can do to make God love you anymore. And there's nothing you can do to make God love you any less because you are loved. God love, God's love for his people, it's infinite and unconditional. And the only ground for God's love is God's love. Jesus said, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. No one can snatch them out of my hand. And we know that the Apostle Paul often wrote on this, uh, on this theme. He believed in the security of the believer, that once he was saved, he would always be saved. Even when he was struggling to the point of defeat and despair, he never doubted his salvation. And when struggling with sin and, uh, and, and self-effort, he still had great, great confidence that he would not be judged by God in eternity for his sins. He knew that he had genuinely trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ and he was now in a living and a loving relationship with the Lord. And this evening, you see, you and I who are in Christ, and that's, that's another sermon, uh, look at that in weeks to come maybe, in Christ. But those of us who have a relationship and are in union with Christ, we need never fear, we need never fear the wrath of God or eternal punishment. Christ has taken our sins, he's taken them away forever. As far as the east is from the west, so far, has he removed our transgressions from us? Let me just add this, though. Full assurance that you are a Christian, that you are saved, it's not essential. It's not essential to salvation. But it is essential to satisfaction. When you know you're saved, when you can say, as the Apostle Paul did, I know, I know whom I have believed, then there's a, there's a satisfaction there's, a, there's a, a spring in your step. And, and when you do go testifying and sharing uh, your testimony, you do that with confidence, you do it with courage, and you do it with, with assurance. None of us, though, should be content with just hoping and trusting. We should, we should ask the Lord to lead us to that place of, 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 of full assurance. What a comfort, then. Surely, what a comfort it is to know that through... Uh, all, all our sins and our struggles through our fleshly efforts, our shortcomings, those times of despair and discouragement, those defeats that, that God loves us and he sees us. He sees us in his son. He sees us clothed in the robes of the righteousness of Christ. Thus our standing before God is perfect. Our standing before God is perfect, although we know only too well that our state and our practice is imperfect. We know that only too well. So often the flesh longs for, uh, for, for sin, runs after sin, and yet we know we are a forgiven people, a blessed people, a cleansed people. Condemnation or judgment in any sense or any way no longer applies to those who are trusting Jesus Christ for salvation. And as I so often say at times like this, it's not therefore we can live as we please or, or do what we want. We have been set free, set free from uh, the Lord of death, set free from the power of sin, not to please ourselves. We have that assurance that we're forgiven and God loves us, uh, even if, as there is only one to love. But we do not please ourselves. Ours is to please, to please the Lord. So often we speak about, well, I'm no longer under the law, I'm under grace. But the grace of God has come into our hearts that we might love the Lord of God, that we might want to obey 
the Lord of God. The Lord of God is no longer a burden to us. He no longer judges us because we are now under, under grace. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In the presence of Pilate, the Jews, the Romans, Jesus was condemned to death. Then on the cross, he bore, he bore our sins. He bore the punishment for our sins, a punishment that you and I deserved for our sin. But now through, through faith, through faith in him, we are no longer condemned. We stand before God. We stand before God justified and acquitted from all charges. In Christ, we are found not guilty. The meaning of condemnation is literally judgment coming down on someone. Judgment coming down on someone. It's a verdict of guilty and the execution of the penalty that the guilty verdict demands. But Paul says to Christians, God's judgment is not going to come down on you, not now, not ever. How is that? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. A minister was preaching from the text, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. When suddenly he was interrupted by an atheist, an unconverted man, who asked, how can blood cleanse sin? For a moment, the preacher was silent. Then he continued, How can water quench thirst? I don't know, replied the infidel, but I know it does. Neither, neither do I know how the blood of Jesus cleanses sin, answered the preacher, but I know that it does. But I know... And it does. And you tonight should have that assurance if you're in Christ. You know, you know that it does. You know that your sins have been cleansed. There are only two types of people. Whatever modernity is going on, there are only two categories of people in the world. Those who are in Adam and still under condemnation and those who are in Christ, who are saved forever and for whom there is no condemnation. Those who have identified themselves with Christ will never face any judgment. The Lord said, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. And so this condemnation of which the Bible uh, speaks of, it doesn't begin at the end of our lives when we, when we leave this earthly scene. It's already active and in progress. Sinners outside of Christ, they stand condemned already. And they are just waiting for that sentence to be carried out. The unbeliever has his final judgment day before him. But the believer in Christ, we have our judgment day behind us. It happened at the cross. He was judged there in our place. And as I said this morning, bear in shame and scoffing rude. In my place condemned he stood. Sealed my pardon with his blood. And no wonder we say, Alleluia, what a saviour. Billy Graham said, if we are believers in Jesus Christ, we have already come through the storm of judgment. It happened at the cross. If we are saved, we are saved from the wrath of God. No longer are we lost sinners living under his condemnation and doomed to an eternity in hell. Isn't that amazing? That's just so, so wonderful. My dear friends tonight, Without faith in Christ, you stand condemned right now, wherever you are. What amazing grace. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are 
in Christ Jesus. For the Christian, that little word, now, separates the old way of life from the new way of life. Before we came to faith in Christ, we were under the sentence of death and final judgment. We were under the power of the law of sin and death. We were under that power, the power of the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death refers to the old fallen nature, the unrenewed nature that was ours before we came to Christ, before we were born again. The law of sin and death, referring to the the strong principle of, of power, the power of sin, or even the love of sin that dominated our lives as unbelievers. And unchecked, that life under the law or the power of sin was leading us towards towards death, eternal death, and eternal separation from God. But because of faith in Christ. We are now freed. We are freed from from sin's power by this this new principle, the law of the spirit of life. The law of the spirit of life. That is the life which we received when we came to faith in Jesus Christ. When we were born again, the Lord said to Nicodemus, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, You must be born again. And when we were born again, it was a work of God, an act of God. The Spirit came into our experience, into our life, renewed us, washed us, regenerated us, gave us an understanding to see the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus also said in John chapter 6, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words I have spoken to you our spirit, and our life. And so to be set free from the law of sin and death, we needed new life. We needed a new life to be given to us from God's Holy Spirit. And along with this new life came complete forgiveness of sins past, present, and future. Past, present, and and future. The law of the spirit of life frees us from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death, it, it, it pulled us downward. It used to control us and condemn us before we came to faith in Christ. Before we were converted, we had no choice, dare I say. We had no choice but to be controlled by the law of sin and death. And what we need to know that even now, that law is still operational in our lives. Sin still attacks us and tempts us and tests us and tries to hold us down, to trip us up, to cause us pain. But it can only operate through our own foolish choices. When you and I foolishly fall into sin and begin to live our lives walking after the flesh or or seeking to please ourselves and not walking after the Spirit and seeking to to please the Lord. But that Holy Spirit, who now works in your life and my life, is is the life of of God. And it's the life that uh, pertains to the, the risen life of Christ. And he empowers us and enables us to live a life of, of, of victory in Christ Jesus. That's what Paul meant when he wrote, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So my friends, we're we're not alone and we shall never be alone. We can make all the excuses in the world when we fail and when we fall and we sin against the Lord. But we needn't fail and we needn't fall and we needn't sin because the life of God is within. Born again believers, we've received the Holy Spirit. Imagine the whole triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit working in your life and my life. Only the Holy Spirit can bring a new life 
to a heart that is spiritually dead. And when that happens, when that happens, the Christian walk is a constant trust in the soul sufficiency of Christ Jesus. Verse 5, we read, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who live and are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. Think about things that, that please the Spirit. Paul tells us that we're, we're strengthened now. We're strengthened uh, with power through God's Spirit in our inner being. The law of the Spirit of life. That's how the Spirit of Christ dwells in our hearts. And now you and I are enabled to, to, to live the Christian life. A Christian life that is, that is pleasing to God. And sometimes when you speak to those who may be seeking or searching or those who have an interest in the things of God, one of the excuses is, well, they'll never be able to keep it up. Well, neither will they and neither could we. It's the Holy Spirit living in us who lives Christ's life in us and works that life out in our day-to-day -day walk with him. It's the spirit who produces the, the spiritual fruit in our lives, even though sometimes it seems to be very slow growing. But there's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So no matter how closely, how closely you and I are walking with the Lord, we're not completely free from sin's power. <clears throat> but we're no longer slaves to sin. We're not completely free from its power, but we are no longer slaves to sin. And the love of sin no longer controls us and can no longer destroy us. Why? Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets us free from the law of sin and death. And you know yourself in your own experience, we have this struggle and we'll have this struggle and this warfare with sin till the day we're taken home to glory. The apostle Paul could say of himself that that great theologian, that great man of God, oh wretched man that I am, who shall uh, deliver me from this body of sin? And that's your experience and my experience. So often we just, we just wish we hadn't have said that or gone there or thought like that or, or, or did such and such a thing. We just wish we hadn't have done it and we cry out, oh, who's going to deliver me from this body of sin? But Christ has delivered us from this body of sin through the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Now, how did this all happen? In verse 3 we read, For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. So he condemned sin in sinful man, that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. Let me go to the New Living Translation again. The Lord of Moses could not save us because of our sinful nature. But God put into effect a different plan to save us. He sent his own son in a human body like ours, except that ours are sinful. God destroyed sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. And so verse 3 makes it clear that where the law of God, the law of Moses, failed, Christ prevailed. The law, you see, could never make you and I righteous. In fact, all that the law could do, the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, all the law could do was, was point out to us how sinful we really were. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature. In our own humanity, no matter how strong we may have thought we were, we could never, we could never obey the law. Of, in our own humanity, we could never obey the law of God. Even if we, we wanted to, we were too weak, too stubborn, too selfish, too sinful. Call it, call it what you may. The law did not have the power to change us or to save us. Because as it says, the law was weak. 
But it was made weak because of our refusal or powerlessness to obey the law. In fact, God's law was given to reveal sin, not to remove it. The law of God is like a mirror. It can reveal our flaws, but it cannot remove them. The law, someone has said, is a court of justice and finds us guilty before God. But the gospel is a throne of grace and it brings us to Christ. The law demands from us what it cannot give. Grace gives all it demands. The law tells me how crooked I am. Grace comes along and, and straightens me out. And if the law was for the condemnation of sinners, the gospel was and is for the saving of sinners. So he condemned sin in sinful man by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And this particular verse is one of the most definitive statements of what we call substitutionary atonement. Bearing shame and scoffing root, in my place, condemned he stood. It expresses the heart of the, the gospel message, the wondrous truth that Christ paid the penalty on behalf of every person who would turn from sin and trust him as Lord and Saviour. He came in a human body, a body in human likeness uh, of sinful flesh, yet without sin, that he might die for sin. If there was one little sin in the life of Christ, he would not be worthy to pay the price uh, for you and I, not worthy to pay our debts. But he had no sin. And he provided a righteousness for us in the sight of God. Isaiah writes in chapter 53 and verse 5, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, by his wounds we are healed. His sacrifice at Calvary was the sin offering by which he dealt with the problem of sin in your life and my life to the glory of God. And the writer of Hebrews confirms this to us. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So tonight, if you're a Christian, you can never, you can never be condemned for sin because God condemned the very thing that could condemn you. That is your sin. And the price was paid some 2,000 years ago, unless you want to go further back before the uh, creation of this world. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let me sum up what all of that means. No condemnation really means for the believer in Christ Jesus. We may stumble, we may fall, we may trip, we may make a thousand mistakes, we may sin and we do. We may get off the path, we might go astray. We may have a thousand problems. But for the believer in Christ Jesus, therefore now, no condemnation, no judgment, no censure. Because God has said it, we believe it. What more could love do? Let me close with a verse of John Wesley's great hymn. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him my living head and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Amen. Then and may the Lord bless these uh, thoughts to us this evening. Almighty and ever blessed God, we thank you again for your word and that word of assurance. 
And we pray, Lord, that we might truly know that uh, the work that you uh, offered on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins, the empty tomb that you rose from and ascended into heaven, it was a complete work. And therefore, we have a complete salvation. Although we wait that day for the glorious and completion of our redemption, when we shall have new bodies and we shall be in glory with Christ. But we thank your loving Heavenly Father. And we pray that we would have that mind of Christ. We would know a spirit of humility. We would never seek to boast or claim that we're better than others. But we would see ourselves as Jesus. Albeit in the form of God. And made himself of no reputation taking on him the form of a servant, and so should we, as we seek to share and show the gospel to others. Bless us, Lord, as we go into this week, and help us to remember, to remember, Lord, the wonders of your grace. And all this we ask is in Jesus' name, and for his sake. Amen. Let's uh, close now by singing from, from the hymn, hymn 433. In 433, my God, I love thee not because I hope for heaven thereby, nor yet because who love thee not are lost eternally. Thou, O oh my Jesus, thou didst me upon the cross embrace. For me didst bear the nails and spear and manifold disgrace. The whole of him, 433. <coughs> My God, I love
And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.